Hello, everybody. Again, here to Mayan Tempogene's international broadcast. I have my good friend Bo with me today. Hello, Bo. How are you? Hello. And today, Mayan, you have invited special guest, your friend, Paul Arne Dan. Would you like to introduce him? And there you go. Thank you, Anita. And hello, Paul. And hello, also, Mary. welcome. Isn't it great? Sitting here. You know, we're normally a lot closer to each other when we talk, but then we now have got this Zoom meeting, which is great. And um, I would like to introduce everybody to Paul, uh, Paul Arndale, I better said. He has been a friend of mine with his wife, Lotte Keeler, who wrote my books, which is fantastic. I have to come in on that one and just put her into the picture too. And uh, with Paul, I have known him through mutual friends, I have to say. Uh, but I have also, of course, followed Paul for some while because we have worked quite closely together and we will talk a little bit about that, about the filming in which we have made. Uh, also the many interviews that Paul have done with me in various different magazines over the years. And uh, Bo Lotte, his wife, and Paul drove me around some of my demonstrations in Denmark. So Paul firsthand could actually see my mediumship. And also Lotte could write about who I really was. And for me, I have to say, it is one of the most important things. If I have to work with people, as which I have with Paul, it is to know who I am. It is called the research for the person who are interviewing me or filming me. I had the same with another journalist in Newland called Paul Black. He also followed me around like what Paul has looked, seen, been and so forth. The same was it with another journalist. And I actually have to say, and I will say it right now, from a medium's part, you feel much more better when you know the people you're working with has a certain belief or understand who you are because it's very difficult to find out with the people you are either filming or you are interviewing with because that who are they but if you know a little bit about the background or you have seen their work or you have been with them and you have a couple of beers or whiskey or gin or gin and tonic or whatever you want to have fisk style as another one and all those kind of things then you see what happens. That is, you start to know, learn who they are and how far you can take me. One of the things I liked about Paul, and I always have to have a laugh about that, but every time we did some filming and everything was always, you can film this and this and this and you could do that. But then Paul used to say to people, don't turn it off the camera. She speaks much better if she doesn't know it's running. So, and that you did. So I was just sitting there and I was talking and things like that. The camera hasn't actually stopped at all, but you got some really interesting things on the camera because you knew how it work. Sometimes you can sit with people and you're under pressure and you might not get to where you want. But if you think that suddenly the camera is turned off and it's just you and I, you get it all. So I like you for that, Paul, sneaky fella. That's all I would like to say. So what I will do now, I would like to ask Paul where we first met and how did we meet and, and, and so forth. So I will now give my little time over to you, Paul, and welcome once again. Thank you. <laughs> well, first time I met you was exactly where you're sitting now in your house in, in, in Waterloo. Uh, I'm a journalist and I've been traveling and staying in London a lot of times and a common friend of ours had several times said to me, Paul, you have to do an interview with Marion Damper Jeans. And then I said, well, who is she? What can she do? Oh, she's a medium. Oh, she's a medium. Yes, she's talking to the dead. And I said, oh my God. <laughs> well, so I postponed the interview a couple of times when I was over there. But then uh, at one time, it, and it was in March 1997, I remember it clearly. Uh, my order book was a bit thin. Then I thought, well, okay, I'll do my Marion Dampty Deans, for God's sake. <laughs> and I went to you to do the interview and uh, 
quite a normal interview, but, uh, and you talked about your work and I got really interested in it. And then in the middle, when th there was a photographer with me and when he was going to the loo upstairs, you said, there's somebody sitting next to you. <laughs> and I said, oh, right. I couldn't see anybody. And then he said, oh, we'll, we'll get back to that. And then we continued the interview, the photographer got back and then we, the interview was over. And then you said to me, Paul, he's still sitting there. We want to talk to you. And uh, it was a bit scary. <laughs> but, and then you said to, so, and you, I said, who was it? Was it a he? Yes, it was a he, all right. And he just wants to say one thing to, no, one thing to you. He's sorry he never said goodbye to you. And I said, yeah, but, but who is it? So he's, you said, I don't know, but he's, he's very young. And then you corrected yourself and said, no, he's not young. He's youngest. He looks young, but he's our age. And he died very recently. And you were very close to him. And he has just one thing to say to you. I'm sorry I didn't say goodbye to you. And five months before, and then you said one thing more, one thing more. he died quite recently because his uh, spiritual voice hadn't quite adjusted to talking as it did. But so that's why I know that he died recently. And well, then I got the goosebumps because my very best friend had died five months earlier. And the last time I saw him, he was in the hospital. A few days before he died, he was dying from cancer. And I went up to him and he was furious. He was really mad. He said, I'm, not, I, I'm so mad I'm gonna die and I don't deserve it. And I, can't, I haven't, haven't got any, any, any power. I can't even smash that bloody television uh, set up there. And I said, Lars, his name was Lars. He said, Lars, I just want to say goodbye to you. I don't want to say goodbye to anybody. Yes, I said, I don't want. And then I said, Lars, I'm sure we're going to meet again. I said, Paul, you know, I don't believe in that hocus pocus. Uh, I don't want to say goodbye to anybody. And then he turned around, faced the wall, and that was his last word to me. And then five months later, I sit with you, and he says, Som somebody says, uh, I'm sorry I didn't say goodbye. Well, it could be anybody, of course. But then you said, he's saying a name. His name, he says, Torsten. Torsten. Do you know anybody named Torsten? And I couldn't remember anybody named Torsten. And then you said, all right, all right, go home and think about it. As we always do when you, we don't remember. Go home and think about it. Go home and do your research. But then there was these what, in, independent sounds in the room. And I heard it. And the photographer who was there heard it too. And you said, well, that's just a way the spirits tells you that it's, it's right what I'm saying. And then when I get, got home, I told one of my best friends, who also know my friend Lars, I said, I've told about my experience with you. And then he said, Paul, you bloody idiot. Torsten was his other best, best friend. You knew him. You never saw each other, but he was a very good friend and you knew him. And Lars played bridge, card bridge, with him every fortnight. And he wants, well, uh, he wanted to tell you, it, it is me that's talking to you. <laughs> and that, express, that, that, that experience uh, convinced me that uh, you were something special. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> so that is why we started to work together, was it? Yeah, yeah. And then I, I didn't interview, it, it was for an interview for the, for the great Danish fashion magazine called In. That's right. And, and, and uh, call, I call it Marion and the Spirits. That's right. It, it, it went quite well, yeah. <laughs>
it did actually but yeah. that was also before that we actually started working together yeah. on films and things like that and we start, you started coming out to see my work so we, it must have been carried on the friendship between us and and then meeting Lotte and things like that yeah yeah so we met in Copenhagen I stayed in your place a couple of times you know when I was home in Denmark which was really lovely but there was also part of this one where you did go around to see me work in various different halls or theatres or whatever we had. We don't have many spiritualist churches in Denmark. And I always remember that, you know, they still had, or spirit was still extremely active around you and Lottie because you had mm -hmm. independent voices. You suddenly have voices coming out <laughs> and things like that, which is, for me, it's, it's wonderful when spirit can do that. You saw me work sometimes in the halls. When, I mean, where, where did we go? What did you see, Paul, with me working? Well, yeah, one thing I remember was when we were uh, driving to a, a demo, one of your big demonstrations in the south of Denmark, mm -hmm. in our small, very small, Shat 600 car. And uh, on the way, there wasn't a lot of space. I was driving, you were sitting next to me, Lotte, my wife, I was sitting in the back seat, and suddenly there was a, a voice saying, Katafra which means potatoes in Danish, and once more, kachafla. And then my wife says, Paul, why do you say potatoes? I didn't say anything, but I heard it, and, and nobody ever said it. <laughs> and then uh, you, were, you were just smiling. I said, oh, don't mind, don't mind. And then when we came to the demonstration, an old man come through to... To, 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 to talk to his daughter and he was deceased many years ago but he was a great potato farmer uh, and that was uh, it, it was typical for, for, for your work that, that you get uh, information about the, the, the people you're going to have contact with on, on beforehand. Absolutely, yeah. And, and the it's same happened when, when we were and we were doing television. You always said in the morning, da -da 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 -da, even the day before, and wrote down, and you didn't know what we were going to do, but you, you, had your, you already got your information. That's right. It's one of the things I think that I, people don't understand about me. I often sometimes, as I told you many times, and Lottie, I get the information sometimes a day before or on my way. And also Spirit has got a way of actually going into people's houses to let them know I'm on my way. So mm. the light goes funny, the door starts to knock, there smells in the house. And every time I go also with you lot, there has certain things that's happened within your home. But one of the most funniest things I always remember and have actually written about but I still are laughing at that day and it just shows you sometimes the innocency in 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 my work but I was flying this time I think it was with Sass from London and I was coming home to Denmark because that you was in the middle of making uh, a, a documentary films called A Feeling for Murder. Yeah. Uh, murder. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. It. murder. Yeah. A Feeling for Murder. And I was sitting and it was in those days where you actually got a little bit of food. And what I had there, that was a, a roll uh, of bread and then a cup of tea. And then there was some kind of sausage or whatever it was. And it was it, it was put in front of me. And I had somebody sitting next to me and you know, the, flat, the, the flat was um, was full. And I was just sitting there. And in those days, we was actually getting proper knife and forks to eat with. And I remember sitting there and thinking, I wonder what's going to happen today with Paul and where am I? And I took my piece of bread and I stacked it. And I went, funny things. But then I couldn't stop stabbing it. I was sitting like this, stabbing my bloody piece of bread, just like that, my, my, my roll of bread. And the guy next to me sort of moved a little bit further sideways like this. And a woman over there, she was looking at me. And the stewardess came down and took my food away from me and my knife. And I remember coming to you and saying, I don't know what's happened, but I've been stabbing my bread up in the air and I've had nothing to eat. And truthfully enough, that day, we had to go somewhere, was it the next day, where a woman has been stabbed many of times. And that was a kind of, 
if you like, premonition, it was a thought, it was everything else that actually came with me on the, fl uh, on the plane, stabbing a piece of bread. So these yeah. are the things you were talking about. Things happen well before I can sit and I can draw it or I will sit and I will write about it and things like that. And sometimes it doesn't make sense whatsoever. But yes, I do remember some of the things. I remember, I remember, I, I, I remember that program we did there. Did it, you? Was an old, it was an old lady living alone in her house next to the Hannes Fjord. And she was stabbed, I think, 84 times or so. And the, it was an unsolved murder. And you, you, you did some psychometry to, with some of her jewels and on a, on a picture of her. And you met her, her, her two children, her, her daughter and, her, and her, her son. And you, you told them exactly what you experienced had happened. And nobody had told you anything at all. Yeah. And, and they could just uh, say, yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right. And then you, in the end, you had a knowledge of how the murder had taken place and who might be the murderer, or he, where the person lived. And they said it, exactly what, what we have thought all the time. Mm -hmm. But the problem was, the murder had an alibi, his wife, and the police uh, had to believe the the alibi. And by the way, they didn't believe in what you were. Yeah, they th thought you were doing hocus pocus. I know that's and, something. I think that's something we always get to know. Oh, that's hocus. That's right. It's, she can have read it, but then again, you know, Paul. How do I read something and know about something that goes back many, many years in Denmark? I wasn't living there at the time. I was living in in England. I didn't have the accessibility at those times to go on the internet and start finding stories or whatever. And I think that many people forget that in the many of films that I have made that I don't actually know the background. I haven't read the stories because many of the stories we did, Paul, it wasn't a story that happened a year before. It goes, it, it went back in time. You were searching for them way back. back, way back, many of them, yes. Mm, many of the stories was just way back, so it is. And and, and, and nobody had before had told you what you were going to do, no. uh, where we were going, or what the case was about. You were you were you you were blank. Yeah. Nobody had told you anything, and 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 I remember one another one, where the police was involved. I don't know if you remember. Her name was Inge Kruse. It yes, was, a little bit. It was, yeah, an, it was an answer. Yeah, I remember. Uh, and she disappeared. Yeah. She was going to the theatre. She, mm -hmm. she didn't turn up, and mm -hmm. nobody ever saw her again, and nobody found her body. Yeah. And then, uh, beforehand, you had been sitting, drawing a small drawing of a house with small towers and, you know, some, an old fashioned house. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you said another thing, you said, I'm suffocated, I'm suffocated. It's as if I'm being put in a hole and there's a, a ground and mud and something around me, I'm suffocated, I'm buried. Mm -hmm. And uh, you had a colleague with you. You, you were always two uh, clairvoyants on, on, on the program. The other one was Elsa. You know Elsa Hansen? Yeah. And she said, she said, when we have to find where she was murdered or dumped, we have to pass a railway. That was one of the things. And then we talked to, to uh, the deceased's two brothers. Mm -hmm. And they show you showed them. Uh, I did. You, I think you you showed them the the, the drawing you'd done. He said, "Oh yes, that's the old place down at Fobo, out next to the water, where we used to go and swim uh, when we were young, and where we uh, and where we went dancing. It was a dance hall and a restaurant and things like that. And and it, it, at the time when." Uh, when, when Inger was murdered, it was torn down. 
and they were building a huge uh, Danlan, it's called uh, a huge hotel with swimming pools and everything. And uh, and uh, you said, oh, very. I think she's done there in in in, in the cement. Mm -hmm. And 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 Elsie was said the same independently of you. You never met each other. Like you, you were working independently. Uh, and but you know there was it was a huge hotel now and we couldn't do anything about it. Uh, but then after the program was uh, was uh, sent, mm -hmm. the police in Odense, the the chief of, of criminal investigation, he contacted me and said, Paul, I think they've got something there because I had experienced before that that mediums had told me things that relate to the to 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 a, a lead in the investigation and then we took down there with the chief of criminal police in Odense and you and Elsa and we went down there and then we went round this Danlan this modern hotel and, and and we asked can we come inside why they said well I've got the police with me and uh, there might be something going on here at some time in the in, in the future and then we went in there and we went round in the, in 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 the house in, in the in the hotel went down to the basement where there was a huge swimming pool and both of you said she's here so at the time and what 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 the the, the funny thing is you know, funny is a wrong word but the the, the guy who everybody, including the brothers, expected to be the murderer. He lived just 100 meters away from where he, where you thought he, she was dumped. But, mm -hmm. and I, I'm, I'm sure you, you were right, but we, we couldn't tear down the hotel and- the but, well, Why not? <laughs> but, but, but for once the police yeah. believed you. And that was very, that's really rarely. No, why they believed me, Paul. It was something that the police told me. Yeah. There is a clue to this one. Okay. Yeah. When you have a story that goes out to the newspapers, you only get a little of the story. You don't get the details. Mm -hmm. But I actually told in that investigation that he was rolled in. Uh, I think it was uh, something that was lying on a bed. Right. And he was actually rolled in that one. And I told them what it looked like and the colors and everything else like this. I said, that's what and how she got into the... Uh, to the back of the whatever car truck or whatever it was yeah, yeah. And i remember the police said that was something we have never ex never told anybody about that mm. but that was the only things in her flat that was missing and that was the thing that was on her bed yeah, that, something was, like that. Yeah. that was missing and the colors and the way that you describe it is exact what it was but that was missing and that's when you said to me, that's why we start to believe 